Kim and Lawrence coming up? I just want to say hello first. Hi. Great to see you. How are you? Great to see you both. Where should we sit? Right here? Is this good? Why don't you come into the light a little okay. bit more? Um, right there is good. And, you know, this is really a kind of an astonishing time uh, to be talking about uh, AIDS. And I'm, I'm so grateful that the whole world is going to know a little bit more about your story this morning because of that terrific article uh, in the New York Times. But why don't you start out, uh, Tim, by just giving us a little bit more about your experience. I know that you first learned that you had been infected back in 1995, and for many years you were just living with AIDS. Yeah, um, when I first found out uh, that I had HIV, um, I was scared to death because at that point I thought it was a death sentence. And uh, luckily, um, in about a year, um, the uh, combination treatments came out and uh, so I was able to take those and um, did pretty well on those. Um, I um, thought that I could live pretty much um, a normal life. And With the retrovirals, yeah, what's going on. Right. Um, and then uh, in 1990, or no, excuse me, 2006, I um, developed leukemia, AML, acute myeloid leukemia. And, uh, and that was a huge shock because I had had a, um, a deadly disease and had now had one that um, was even more deadly um, that could kill, kill me um, um, in a matter of a few months. And um, so I found out and the the next day I was in the hospital um, getting, um, getting chemo treatments. I thought that that would be the end of it, um, that I'd have the chemo treatments and um, that would be it. Uh, but then um, Dr. Huter um, uh, started talking about... A young researcher in Berlin, yeah. yeah. Um, started talking about um, getting, having my blood tested to find a um, potential donor for me, and uh, um, I thought, okay, um, didn't really understand why. Um, um, so he did, and uh, and I had um, 266 possible donors, which is a huge number because um, there are even there are people that don't have any donors. And, and his great insight here was to choose from the population of donors to. to, to to have the donors be a population, um, mostly Northern Europeans, yeah. who are basically, I, I know this is scientifically not correct, but basically immune yeah. to the AIDS, uh, AIDS um, virus. Yeah, uh, he, he came up with the idea of um, uh, looking for a donor who was immune, who um, had the, the um, this, uh, depletion of the CCR5 Delta 32, um, protein, um, which uh, um, which made them immune to HIV, and he thought that um, if I were to get a stem cell treatment from a per person like that, um, it would make me immune. And sure enough, you get yeah. the stem cell, you get the transplant, mm -hmm. and not only is your leukemia treated, right, but you're completely cured of AIDS, no yeah. AIDS in your body, no exactly. HIV. Right. First time it's ever happened. Yeah. What, what, what was the moment like when he came in and told you that? Um, I don't think I really believed it until um, much later. <laughs> Hard to um, blame you for that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, um, his paper was rejected by um, the New England, Metal, New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, at first, uh, and uh, so they didn't believe it, and so why should I believe it? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point, but one doctor who did believe it mm -hmm. was Dr. Lawrence right here. You looked at these results, and I, I was reading about this, and uh, you look at the results and say, this is working, why isn't everybody else paying attention? Right, right. I couldn't, when I first read about this. It was a tiny abstract in February of 2008. 
at a meeting in Boston, and I couldn't believe that the world wasn't jumping mm. up and down. Yeah. And I wrote an editorial about it a couple of months later, and I got two letters uh, based on the editorial. I don't think anyone really believed mm. it. And um, with uh, some funds provided by AMFAR, we held a think tank at MIT, and I called uh, Mr. Brown's doctor from Berlin to come down and speak to a panel, including people from the NIH, industry, uh, universities. And uh, there were 13 of us together. We spent two and a half days talking about him, uh, organizing uh, blood samples to be sent around the world to, to test this. And at the end of this entire presentation, we took a vote to decide. I asked the question, OK, how many of you 13 people believe this person is cured? In the sense of, of Mr. Brown sitting here, off all therapy, um, antibody negative for the virus, and 13 of the 13 raised their hands. Uh, the they all believed it. Yeah. Believed it. Robert Gallo said he couldn't buy it. That's correct. Really? And the New England Journal rejected it. Well, we had a journalist in the audience, Mark Schoops, and he wrote an article about it for the Wall Street Journal. It was picked up by the New York Times the next week. And a little bit of the power of the press, the New England Journal of Medicine calls back and says they're reconsidering. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was published. Um, and we did follow up, and we organized, again, with funds provided by AMFAR to have blood samples sent throughout the world to be tested. Um, I was invited to give several presentations by uh, private organizations and by the NIH about the patient to discuss what was going on. Of course, no one knew where he was. At, the, at this time, he was anonymous. And, and the types of questions that I would get from the scientific audience was someone came to me afterwards in one of the uh, NIH-sponsored presentations and said, uh, we were asked to ask you this question. Do you think he's made up? Well, how yeah. do you explain the resistance from the established community? I think it wasn't, you know, for me, when I first read it, I said, this makes perfect sense. You have a mutation that we know will make you vul invulnerable to getting infected with HIV. If we can replace all the cells susceptible with HIV, to HIV in your body with these transplanted cells, then eventually you ought to be able to provide a system where if there's a virus hanging out someplace, it has no home to live in and grow in. It made perfect sense to me. But I think, you know, with one case, certainly done in Berlin where they don't have a hands-on, someone being anonymous, it, it still, there was a lot of skepticism in the, in the scientific community. And there had been, you know, the, the whole idea of a search for a cure had been put on the back burner since the discovery uh, of the retrovirals because this was, people began to believe and demonstrate that this is something you can live with. AIDS is something you can live with. Right. So it, it, it became a, almost a, OK, but this is totally off the realm of practicality. You know, this is done with a bone marrow transplant. The risk of dying from such a transplant in the first 100 days is somewhere about 50%. And, and Tim, this is not an easy treatment. Right. This has been, you know, tell us a little bit about what you've had to go through. Or what Any diseases like uh, cancer. How would you compare where we are in the, in the search for a cure versus the search for a vaccine right now? So I, I think we are much further ahead in terms of, of, uh, of a cure and looking for a cure and figuring out ways to, to search out and destroy latent reservoirs and potentially use these genetic engineering techniques to affect a cure than we are with a vaccine. I think vaccine research um, has been slow and steady. All the easy things have been done. The experiments are incredibly expensive because we need 5,000, 10,000 people in large field trials to try out. I think we're, we're very far away from a vaccine. I've said 20 years ago, and I'll still say it today, there will not be a, a useful vaccine in my lifetime. But you still I, believe that today? I still believe that. But I do think that we may have an effective cure in my lifetime. And so I, I, you know, so I, I, would, I would hate to, 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 to you know, uh, challenge one research versus the other. They're all incredibly important pieces of this research. This poses need a, a, vaccine. A, a very practical question for decision makers. We all know we're living in a time, uh, at least on the, in governments, of scarce resources, cutbacks of the federal government, cutbacks in state governments, cutbacks in local governments, and they all have to face this decision of where do you target you know, limited resources. You'd say put it into the cure? Well, Amphor is, is particularly devoted towards a cure, and, and that's what we're working towards, and that's our motto. The NIH covers a much broader range, and the NIH has, has significant amounts of dollars put in vaccines. And I think it's wrong <laughs> to challenge one area of research versus another, because a lot of what we've learned in the immunology of vaccine research we're applying to cure. And I think a lot of what we're learning in cure research will apply to vaccines. So I think they both need to be to ongoing. And for as an organization is focused on the cure. Mm -hmm.
we in the end game? We're, we're, we're beginning to see where the end is. I think that's the best way to look at it. Um, and it's been, uh, as Dr. Diefenbach pointed out, a relatively short period of time that we got here. And we've been talking about potential cures for cancer and many types of cancer for a very, very long time since the war on cancer. And yet, for many types of cancer, some of the cancers that people get the most, we still don't have a clue about how to cure them. And here in AIDS, in a relatively short period of time, we kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's very different in the beginning. I remember doing an interview in the very start of AIDS before we had a virus uh, for Bill Moyer. We had a show. Um, and, and he asked me, he said, you know, what if it took $5 billion to get to the moon? What if we gave you $5 billion? Could you, could you affect the cure for AIDS? And I said, that's kind of the wrong metaphor. It's not, we'll give you $5 billion and get to the moon. It's, we'll give you $5 billion to get to the moon, but we're not going to tell you where the moon is. Mm -hmm. We now, we know where the mm -hmm. end is. We have a proof of concept sitting right here, which makes me incredibly happy. Um, and, and now we have several technology problems. And you hear about potential approaches from our panelists. Uh, you know, I have our own ideas about how this may go. Um, it's going to be expensive, but we're going to get are, there. Are the technology problems greater than the resource problems now? Um, we always need more resources, yeah, right. but uh, the, the nice thing is that pharmaceutical companies have also joined in the effort. So you've heard about Sangamo in the Times today uh, with the Trenton patient. Uh, Novartis has a, has a big push to this. Several other drug companies have decided that this is important, that if we can, in, can modify stem cells um, without all these side effects and cure this disease, we have an approach to cure lots of cancers, which are actually even bigger markets for mm -hmm. them. So we're kind of bringing in uh, resources that might not even be available to us in AIDS, with the million people infected in the United States, to look at broad benefits for people with many other diseases. That I is, think that's important. That is so exciting. So with that, why don't I turn it over?